Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hello. CMS experiment. Hi there, uh, Kevin uh, and uh, the group over there in um, so my name is Claire, and I'm a South African particle physicist working here at CERN. And uh, I'm Ludivine, I'm French, I'm a chef physicist, and I work for a Taiwanese university in in Taipei. So today we are going to take you on a virtual tour of the CMS experiment. Um, we are in the CMS control room right now. It's looking a little bit dilapidated because we're actually in the process of building a brand new shiny new control room. So we are moving a lot of stuff over from there to, uh, to the new one, um, which is going to be very, very exciting. Um, and Ludovine is going to take us underground and show you all the really, really cool stuff that's uh, 100 meters below our feet. Yeah, I will uh, show you the, the detector, the CMS detector. And uh, we're very lucky because it's open at the moment. So the view is really great and we can explain a lot of stuff. Great. So uh, before we start, do we have any questions from the audience? Also feel free to ask questions, type them in the chat as you go um, and we can pick them up and answer them uh, as they come in. Do you have anything? No. Okay, <laughs> well, would you like to go down so long? Uh, take us yeah. to the ground? All right. We will uh, see you in a bit. So um, here we are in the CMS control room. So while the LHC is running and colliding particles, we have a team of people in the control room all the time monitoring the status of the detector, monitoring uh, the, the data flow, the output, so the quality of the data that we're getting, just to make sure that uh, every single minute of uh, collisions, we are getting the best possible data poss uh, that we can um, so that we can get the best physics results uh, that we can. So um, the Large Hadron Collider is a 27 kilometer circumference ring underneath the, uh, the, 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 the area here. So here is a picture of the, the Geneva um, area. In the background, you can see the Alps with the Mont Blanc right in the center. We have the, uh, the lake, uh, that's uh, Lake Geneva, La Clément. And then you have, to give things a bit of a sense of perspective, uh, you have the airport over there. So that's Geneva Airport, that's the length of the runway. So in comparison, you can see the gigantic size, that's the yellow line. Now, of course, we don't have a yellow line drawn on the surface of the countryside. The tunnel itself is 100 meters underground mostly because it was actually more cost effective to dig a tunnel 100 meters underground the surface um, and underground rather than uh, buying the land at the surface. So uh, here is a nice cutaway picture. Um, so we have the LHC, which is now the biggest and the highest energy of CERN's uh, particle accelerators. Um, and what happens is we get protons, we take them, we start off with a tank of hydrogen gas, and they get sent through a couple of smaller accelerators, and each time getting a little bit more energy and a bit more energy and a bit more energy. The, the previous one, well, one the prior to the LHC is called the SPS, that stands for the super proton synchrotron, and that used to be CERN's uh, highest energy accelerator, which... Uh, 41 years ago now, the uh, W and Z bosons were discovered um, here at CERN. And now protons from the SPS get fed into the LHC, where they then get sped up to 99.99991% the speed of light. And then at four points around this ring, those protons cross over. So if you do um, across, if, if you take a slice through the accelerator, in most places you will see two separate beam pipes. They're only like you know a couple of centimeters big. Oh yeah. Um, oh, that's a great picture there in the center. So you see two separate beam pipes um, where the protons are traveling in opposite directions. But at four points around the ring, these beam pipes merge into one, and the protons cross 
And if the accelerator team is, has been working very hard and they get the, the precision and the alignment and everything just right, then those protons will collide. So Ludovine is standing by. Uh, let's see what she I, does. Yeah, so I will uh, enter the shaft uh, to go down, so to take the elevator to go down. So to do so, I'm badging my dosimeter. It recognized me. And then I will have my iris scan to make sure that this is me. Okay. I try again. It's very <laughs> sensitive to make sure you only enter one person. Okay. And you have to wait. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, I put okay. you on the impact list. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it says. I think it's just I have to be really small. <laughs> so safety is a big priority um, at CERN, and what we do is we place the maximum amount of restrictions going into areas. Um, but once you're in, you can technically get out without any restrictions in case of an emergency. So uh, that's why the system is, is a little bit like this. So she scanned her dosimeter. Um, Very well. she's of course, it's always happening during a <laughs> virtual visit. So let's Don't worry, take it. I, I, I fight with these things all the time as well. If I'm wearing a long skirt, because there's, there's lasers or something that check that you're not sneaking another person in with you. And sometimes if I'm wearing clothes that are a little bit too billowy, then it also triggers the system and kicks me out. So, hey, she made it. Yeah. Cool. Well done. Okay, we are going to have a visit today. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean downstairs. Yeah, we're, we're, going, we're going. Don't worry, fellows. We 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 got you. We're we're going down. We're going down. So now the camera is going through. Um, well, actually, the camera person. <laughs> so you can see them. I don't know if any of you remember the story, Angels and Demons. There was a book uh, by Dan Brown, and then they made it into a movie with Tom Hanks. And um, part of it was, you know, set at CERN. Professional. And they had to, they, well, actually, they killed the guy and stole his eyeball for the iris scan to allow. So good, good news is that um, you actually need to be alive and have blood flowing through your eye for the, the system to work. So... Don't kill us and steal our eyeballs. Uh, and, and needs both eyeballs. Both and, and it needs both eyeballs. You need more than just one. So yeah, don't don't do that because it won't work. And also it will not be very nice for us. So they're in the in the lift now. Uh, they're going to be going almost 90 meters underground. And lost. So um, the the level that they're going to come out at is going to be the same level as the LHC tunnel itself. And what happens when these protons collide? They're colliding head on. So you can imagine two cars, mm -hmm. you know, hitting in a head on collision. Um, when things collide head on, the bits and pieces coming out of the collision can come out in all directions. So what we do is we build our detector to cover as many of these all directions as possible. The best thing would be to build a sphere, a, a spherical detector, but from an engineering perspective, that's quite hard. So instead, as you, we've, what we've got, got is we've built like a, a, a barrel or a tube um, around the collision points. And then to catch the stuff that's coming out either end, we put end caps or lids on the ends of the of, of the barrel. So this is a schematic of the CMS detector, which you will see up close and personal uh, soon with Ludivine uh, when she's down at the bottom. And um, so the different layers in CMS, each are, they're, they're built very differently and each layer tells us something different about the particles that are coming out of the collision point. And when we put all of that information together, we're able to tell the difference between different types of particles. So for example, <clears throat> right, in the, right in the center, we have tracking detectors, which allow particles to move through 
and send little signals, kind of like a join the dots, ding, 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 as they travel. And so our software can do the join the dots and we get a nice track showing exactly where the particle went. After that, we wrap that up in two layers of what we call calorimeters. And a calorimeter's job is to stop a particle, bam, and when the particle gets stopped in the calorimeter, it sends a spray of light, which we collect and we measure, and that tells us the energy that the particle has. Now, there are things called muons, which are kind of like just, they're heavy electrons, and they actually go all the way through the calorimeters and onto the other side. So on the outside of these, we have really big versions of the tracking detectors, which give more dings <clears throat> as, as muons travel through them. And then everything is put, uh, we have a big magnetic field. We actually have the strongest solenoid magnet in the world. Uh, it's almost four Tesla. And this bends charged particles in different directions. So we're able to tell the difference between a positively charged particle and a negatively charged particle. And neutral particles obviously go straight. Uh, Ludovine, how are you doing? Are you uh, down at the bottom there? We're down, so we are a hundred meter um underground in the service cavern so noemi was showing you before that we are indeed underground because you can see the material shaft here uh on the uh, and you can look all the way almost all the way up so the the little light uh, that is here is more artistic than anything else but you can imagine it is a metaphor for all this data so all these pictures of collision that we're taking underground and we're sending uh, then back to the surface to be analyzed so we are going to go to the service cavern so the service cavern as the name states is uh, everything that services the detector cooling electricity but also and we will see it the trigger or the filter to um, to sort the collisions that we are taking. So many, many racks, more racks. Lots of power, lots of uh, uh, controls, lots of gases, lots of everything. Yeah, so we are now in front of uh, many, many racks. So as I said, some of them are powering, some of them are for cooling. And uh, especially we have here what we call the trigger because we need to filter on the collisions we're taking. The number of collision per second is enormous. It's 40 million bunch crossing per second. So I'm saying bunch crossing because the LHC is filled with proton, but they're not just like the one after the other. They're making little packets. And these packets are very dense. There are billions of protons in them, and they are separated by just a few nanoseconds. And when two bunch of billions of protons are crossing, well, actually, you have about 60 collisions that really happen, 60 pair of protons that really do collide and create all these other particles that will then travel through the detector, as Claire was uh, was saying. So 40 million bench crossing times 60, that's an enormous amount of collision. We cannot keep that. We are not interested in all of that. So we're going to keep only the, the, the events that we are interested in that we want to analyze and to look for physics in them. So here, you have a first level of triggering or filtering, and you're gonna keep, it's called the L1 trigger, level one trigger, and you're gonna keep one collision over 400. Then the data are sent to the surface where there is a more elaborate way of filtering, and we're gonna keep only one over a thousand collision. Then all these collisions to all these events, their digital picture, let's say, is sent to the main uh, site of CERN, which is um, a few, just one or two kilometers away, and they are stored forever 
on in the data center. So there is a huge data center and all the events are copied, put on magnetic tape and stored forever. Yeah, so the thing with this is with this, with this 1 in 1,000 uh, events that we, we save, we are literally throwing the information from those other events away. So we have to be very careful that we're only throwing away uh, events that have information um, that we already understand, and we're not throwing away potential signals of uh, new physics, dark matter, and that sort of thing. Those are some cool cables. What are those blue ones? All right. So uh, where Ludivine is, is walking right now, as she said, this is the service cavern. So um, one of the things about uh, CMS, so, so on the screen, uh, you will see a schematic diagram of the underground area. You can see that there are these two cylinders. There's a short, fat one at the top. That's the cavern that holds the detector where you're about to go. And then the long, thin cavern um, next to it, the long, thin cylinder sausage tube thing, is uh, the service cavern. Now, one thing that makes CMS very special is that the ground here in Ceci, France, where the experiment is located, is actually really soft. So when they were digging these caverns 100 meters underground, imagine if you've ever been to the beach trying to dig two like cabins or two holes next to each other in soft beach sand. It's going to collapse in on itself unless you go and you get, you know, that nice sticky beach sand from that's a bit wet and you do some reinforcing. So they had to reinforce with more than seven meters of concrete in between these two caverns. But the upshot of this is that seven meters of concrete is actually exactly what you need to completely protect yourself from the radiation produced by the LHC while it's running, which means that scientists and visitors can come down to the service cavern, which is where Levine is right now, even while the LHC is running. You exactly. can't go into the cavern, but the service cavern. Yeah, and where I'm standing right now is this red door it's the way to the LHC tunnel. So as Claire was saying, the LHC tunnel okay. is separated okay. from the experimental caverns. So I'm saying experimental caverns because there are four uh, main experiments. And all the experimental caverns, they are separated from the LHC tunnel. So why do we have a door here in case of emergency? If a fire blocks our way back to the elevator because yes, in CMS, it's the other way uh, than uh, what you're usually told in case of emergency, you go back to the elevator because it's um, it's protected for, from fire. But imagine something block you the way, you will break the emergency handle and use the lift from the LHC. If you do so, and the LHC was running, Okay, so there would be um, beams circulating or collisions happening, then everything will stop. This is what we call the interlock. Of course, nobody is allowed in the LHC nor in the um, in the caverns when the the beam is running. Okay, and as CMS physicists, we also don't have the access to the LHC. Only the person that really do have something to do on the tunnel will do so. But to compensate, they put us a wonderful poster, okay, real size, life size of the inside of the LHC. So if Noemi is focusing right, I look like I'm inside the tunnel. What do you see inside the tunnel of the LHC? You see these long blue tubes. And what are these blue tubes? They are magnets. The blue ones are dipole magnets, and they're not accelerating the protons. They are bending the trajectory so that eventually the proton make a circle, a very big circle, 27 kilometer. If you are standing in the tunnel of the LET, you don't even realize it's bending, but they do bend very precisely the proton on a circular trajectory. So you can see also that there are some white uh, 
um, tubes. They're a little bit less long. So like the, the, the blue ones are 12 meters long. The white ones are six meters long, but they are called the quadruples, the white one. And they are there to focus the beam because imagine you only have protons inside the beam. All protons are charged plus when you bring together a plus charge and a plus charge, they will have tendency to repel each other. To bring them back together, we focus the beam with this uh, white uh, magnet. And so where are we doing the acceleration? Only in one point in uh, about like 400 meter, uh, no, sorry, 40 meter, 40 meter of the LH is dedicated to the acceleration in radio frequency gravity that at each turn, every time the proton is passing, is kicking them, giving them a boost to accelerate to the final energy and then keeping them at this uh, given energy. Okay. Yeah, there are uh, 1,232 of those dipole magnets, just the dipole magnets, keeping them around in a circle. But there's more than 9,000 magnets in total all the way around the LHC ring. So now Ludovine's at another one of these uh, yellow doors. Yeah, another one. Let, let's see if it gets better. It's better than <laughs> the first one. So now it's the um, the 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 access for the UXC. So to really go and see the detector. Same principle. I badge and I have my iris scan. And while while the LHC is running, this system will not even operate. You can try, but the doors will not open. And the uh, CERN control center, which controls the accelerator, they will actually get an alarm, a notification that somebody is trying to access the underground cavern. Um, no, oh, still not. Nope. It's a it's a bad day for for <laughs> access. Okay, let's try again. One of the things that you really have to have as a particle physicist is patience. <laughs> yeah, there's also, um, I think it, it weighs you going in and coming out to make sure that you're not bringing any pieces of equipment out with you. Um, there are special doors. Yoo-hoo, she made it. There are special doors, uh, that, or a special you know, place that you, you put uh, equipment um, so that it is scanned uh, for radiation and everything to make sure that we're not uh, accidentally uh, bringing radioactive uh, stuff out with us. Um, so, scan. And we are through. So now all that's left is to pass by seven meters of concrete and oh, da, 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 da. welcome to the best and most beautiful experiment on the planet, folks. Ta -da. So we're actually right on the end. And uh, yeah. we're, we're, what are we looking at here? So we are now in front of CMS, okay? So CMS is enormous. It is 25 meter long and 16 meter diameter, and it has a total of 14,000 tons. It's big, but it's actually quite compact. And this even goes in the name. CMS stands for compact muon solenoid. You don't find it compact. Well, Compare it to ATLAS, another uh, experiment, which is on the other side of the LHC uh, ring. ATLAS is 48 meter long and 26 meter uh, diameter for only 7,000 tons. So it's basically twice bigger and twice lighter. So that makes CMS extremely, extremely compact. What we see here is this the beam pipe from the LHC. So as we said, the cavern is separated by a concrete wall from the LHC tunnel, but the beam pipe will go through and will bring the proton into the center of the detector. So the beam, just to give you an idea, uh, the 
largest is about one centimeter. But when we are colliding, the beam is squeezed to the maximum and it's um, a few millimeter. I think it's like less than one millimeter, if I'm not wrong. It's okay. like a hair, like a, the size of a hair. And to when, so when we're doing collision, we're really like in the beam. So we don't want the beam pipe to have a very dense material that will interfere with what is happening with the collision. So it is made of beryllium, which is the second less dense um, element you can uh, you can find, uh, so that the particles that are created at the collision point they just go through without any almost any interaction. We can see the the sense of scale and the size of this by uh, with those people who are working down on the floor there. Uh, they look tiny compared to to the big wheel, the big red wheel end cap over there. But we cannot see the inside. Yeah. So CMS, um, as as you've seen, it, CMS is actually made up of fifteen slices, and these slices were built on the surface, and then each slice was lowered down into the cavern one by one. The heaviest slice weighs two thousand tons, and it took something like uh, ten hours to to lower down because you have to you, you could only go at like 10 meters per hour lowering down each slice so what happens during the winter period as you can see we actually move these slices apart a bit so that people can come in and do uh, work and maintenance and repairs and things on the systems there uh, and then what's happening now is we're actually closing up and we're pushing all the slices back together again uh, in, you know, uh, uh, to get ready for this year's running. But we can still see the muon chambers. So the outermost layer that Claire was talking about, the, the, that will um, spot the muons, which are like a heavy cousin of the electron, uh, they are visible here. We use three different types of technology for the muons, so there will be drift tube, there will be a resistive plate uh, uh, chamber, and uh, and uh, chamber? and cathode strip chamber. Thank you. And the gems gem. now. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And the gems. Gem. So, but okay. Initially three, yes. and we have added well, as a part of the upgrades uh, that will take place in 2026 for all the rest of the detector. As part of this upgrade, we have added the gem, uh, which uh, is uh, using uh, ionization uh, gas chamber to also spot uh, the muons. So here we can see at least the yes. CSC and the RPCs. Yeah. Yeah, I really like the, the, the way that people have stuck very nice labels on each of those uh, panels. Because, yes. uh, the could you imagine? <laughs> um, so I'm sure that we have some questions uh, no. popping up right now. Uh, Kev uh, Kevin, is is there anybody there that would like to ask us anything, especially uh, you know about something that they're looking at right now in the cavern? Kevin, you are muted. They, I haven't picked up any questions from the floor yet. Okay. All right. Oh, wait a minute. How long is the beryllium tube? How long is the beryllium tube? Cool. Uh, How long? Uh, so, so the the beryllium part of the tube is really just around the the, the collision points. Uh, so I think it's going to be a part that is just a couple of meters, but then the rest is now an aluminum, uh, uh, made of aluminum. It used to be made of a stainless steel, but uh, to lower the radioactivity, we have uh, changed completely the beam pipe in 2021, June 2021, if I'm not mistaken. So it will be the same in the other experiment. They will have beryllium in the four other experiments. They will have beryllium over a couple of meters 
around the interaction points, but uh, then the rest would be would be made of uh, of aluminium. And then in the in the, the LHC close to the vacuum pump, you're gonna have some kind of um, bake out sheets. It's called. Uh, it's here as well. Ah, yes, yes, we can see them. You you can see them here as well. Uh, maybe better on the other side. So you you have these bake out uh, sheets that uh, w when you heat them up, they will activate uh, this um, gas material. Yes, this gas material, uh, so that they have this property to um, swallow, if you want to 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 really yeah to really catch any particle that will still float around and in the, in the, and therefore do a very good uh, vacuum. So the vacuum is pumping, of course, but it's also chemical in the sense that this material, once activated, will, uh, will clean, let's say, the rest of the, the particles uh, remaining so that we have a perfect vacuum to have the proton beam circulating in it. Of course, it does not swallow the proton beam. So I'm just talking about uh, molecules that would remain uh, from air, basically. It's like so a bake, sticky paper. The bake, yeah. the, this bake out process is something that we, that the LHC team does before the start of the the, the run in the year, um, to to clean out the beam pipe and to make sure that it's yeah. at uh, you know the highest vacuum possible. But um, just to, to finish with the beam pipe, uh, in CMS, you have only one beam pipe, right? But in the LHC, inside these dipoles, these magnets, these quadrupoles that we have shown you before, you're going to have two separated beam, one for, sorry, beam pipes, one for one beam going in one direction, one for the other beam going in the other direction. And only when they are crossing the experiments, they will go into one single beam. When we are in acceleration phase, which uh, lasts uh, for about 20 minutes, plus 20 minutes of uh, time that you need to fill the LHC with all the protons, so let's say for at least an hour, they will just uh, circulate and get accelerated in the LHC, but they will still pass by CMS. But they are going to be so parallel that they won't touch each other, they won't see each other. Only when you decide to make collision, you have small special magnets at the entrance of the caverns, and when you switch them on, they tilt slightly the, um, the, the direction of the beams, and now the beams are going to collide. The bunches are going to cross, and the protons are going to collide. Yeah, so on the screen here is a, is a picture of the two beams coming up to the collision point. What you're yeah. looking at there, it's a, it's a tube, um, but that's actually the, the cross section of the proton beam. So the blue one is going in one direction and the red one is going in the opposite direction. And you can see how much that beam gets squeezed down um, just you know, to hit at the collision point. Protons are really, 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 really small. And uh, if, I think to get a feel for how, how difficult it is to collide these things head on, it's as if you're standing on opposite ends of a football pitch and you're throwing a needle at each other and you have to get those needles hitting head on from that far away. That is, that is sort of how, how, uh, how difficult it is. That is a beautiful view from up top yeah. there. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's the sp special view for the virtual visit. So as a visitor, you you don't get to come here, but uh, in the virtual visit, we can have this wonderful view. So from one end of the of the cavern, and we have this wonderful pers perspective on uh, on CMS and on the on the beam pipe. So there is. Um, one more component in CMS on top of all these layers of subdetectors on top of the magnets, it's the return, the so-called return yoke, which is made of iron, which is interlaced 
with the muon chambers and which is going to close the magnetic field lines. <clears throat> so this is usually painted in red. So here we see really like the back, uh, the back of uh, of this. And um, yeah. Right, yeah, so the M, uh, sorry, the S in CMS stands for solenoid, which is our amazing, super strong, fantastic magnet. Um, it runs, it's an electromagnet, so it sits at more, more than 18,000 amps when it's turned on. And it's really strong. If you are walking close to, you know, the detector, like those people down there, I had to go and change a power supply earlier this year, and I was holding a screwdriver in my hand as I was walking next to the, um, the, the detector, and the screwdriver was just aligning itself with the magnetic field. I could not, like, if I'm, if I'm forced it away, it would just pull itself back um, to, to be aligned. If you do come here while the machine is on and the magnetic field is on, you can actually see, even in the service cavern, we've got paper clips, and you can see these paper clips curving um, in response to the magnetic field. So that's you know a, a fun reason to come and visit us here at CERN if, if you if you can. Um, but yeah, and you know the magnetic field is is really important because uh, it helps us measure the momentum of the particles, especially the muons, really really accurately. Um, I don't know if you if you remember back to mathematics, but remember if you are trying to draw a curve and you only have, you know, if, if you only have a, like two points, you can draw a straight line between them. Um, but but you know, you can you can have quite a lot of error in in the, the slope that you put uh, put those that? in. Oh. But the more points you have, um, the more accurately you can draw wait, that wait, slope, wait. and the okay. stronger the magnetic field uh, allows you to do this um, more accurately as well. So uh, yeah, this is okay. one of the things that really gives CMS uh, its its strength is is how precisely we are able to measure things like muon momentum as they're traveling all the way through the detector. Okay, so we have another great view to show you, oh. which is. Above the detector, you can see there is a huge shaft, and this shaft is now open. So you can see what you're seeing. This grid is actually the ceiling of the assembly hall above the detector. So the detector was assembled um, in, and tested at the surface in this huge uh, hole, experimental hole, and then it was lowered layer by layer. So you saw earlier, we said like, we can see in between uh, and we can see the muon chambers, we could actually see in between two layers. And these layers were uh, lowered one by one into the experimental uh, cavern. Yeah, and um, I think next month, uh, so as you can see, that uh, shaft up there is open to the sky, the, uh, and that's because people are started. coming in and out and working the, you know, throughout the course of this end of year shutdown period. But next month, we're going to close everything up again to get ready for this year's run. And one thing that we really need to do is a big, thorough, deep clean of the cavern just to make sure that there aren't things like screws that have been accidentally dropped. Um, you know, and, and then when we turn on the magnetic field, that could pick up and fly through the detector and cause a, a lot of damage. Um, last year, I was actually up there on that green thing that you were looking at um, halfway up the shaft. And uh, yes, you find dead mice and, you know, things that have fallen down the shaft. And, and, and you find lots of strange things um when you're doing the, the cabin deep clean but it's also kind of fun because you get to wear like a vacuum cleaner on your back like a ghostbuster and uh my husband thinks it's great <laughs> my husband thinks it's ridiculous because i hate vacuuming at home but i always jump at the chance to come and do the cabin cleaning once a year <laughs> so here we are on the other side of the so we are on the, the other detector. side yeah exactly so, so the same the same view. So like this is one layer. I was I was saying, this is one layer, and here is in between two layers, and the guys downstairs 
are actually in the process of completely closing the detector. So the layer on the left hand side will move towards the right and will um, close the, the detector. So we can really open our detector layer per layer to access the innermost uh, layer to uh, repair things and uh, to do maintenance, which is what we're doing uh, actually right now during during the winter uh, season. So it's our winter break. And the reason why we're yeah, Sorry, the reason first. why we're <laughs> that we're doing the winter break during uh sorry the break the maintenance break during winter is not because we want to go skiing but it is because of the amount of electricity that we need to have the LHC operate the LHC is consuming as much electricity as the canton of geneva okay so not just the city but the but the canton of course uh the LHC has special agreement with the French electricity uh, distribution, uh, but still in winter, the electricity is more expensive and the supply increase also to, uh, to the area, to the, to the homes. So we have to do a three months maintenance. We choose to do it in winter when uh, this uh, condition of electricity uh, price and uh, demand are higher. And uh, then, during the year, we tried to have the LHC operating all the time, 24-7, winter, uh, sorry, uh, evening, night, weekend, bank holidays. Of course, there's going to be repairs to be done in the LHC, but also uh, sometimes in the detectors. Uh, we can have short breaks, one day, okay, a week to do a special, uh, a special maintenance. But the plan, let's say the really plan, uh, long, uh, shed, sorry, long stop is for the winter. And then every, uh, three years, we do an ex, uh, a long shutdown that we, that we call when we do major, uh, maintenance or upgrade. This is what is going to happen in, uh, 2000 and, oh, wait, because the, it keeps changing. So, uh, 2025 now 26. i think the next one should be yeah 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 and then 2026 we should uh we should really start having uh all the the parts of the detector to to be uh replaced yeah i'm saying this because so i was hesitating because the we have a planning okay which was made a long time ago but of course you cannot predict everything like the pandemic <laughs> for example so things keep, you know, shifting and moving. Uh, so this is why I wasn't sure about the, the dates uh, anymore. But yeah, it should be 2025. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go uh, on the other side of the detector and then we will go down on its foot. Cool. So one fun fact that people may not realize about the Large Hadron Collider tunnel itself is that the tunnel is actually tilted at a bit of an angle and that's because on the one side you've got the lake and the side opposite to the lake you have the Jura mountain range um, which has a big granite you know bottom and the only way they could fit a tunnel this big in was to was to tilt it slightly at a few degrees now because our detectors have to be perfectly aligned with the beam that means our 14,000 ton detector is also tilted at a slight angle. It's about two or three degrees, but it is tilted at a slight angle with respect to you know, the ground. So that gives you some additional appreciation of these people moving these you know, 1,000, 2,000 ton slices backwards and forwards just to be able to get inside in between them and fix something. So on this, uh, so we are now to the other side uh, of the of the detector, and you can see that this size was not open, so you cannot see uh, the beam pipe. It's uh, still completely uh, covered. So this is how CMS looks like uh, when we are colliding, basically. And downstairs, you can behind these uh, yellow doors. This is a garage for 
a special part of the, the, the detector, which is the forward region of uh, uh, the um, electromagnet, the hadronic, sorry, calorimeter. So when we are doing some uh, work, we will um, transport them and store them uh, into into the garage. So these, here they are, yeah, and we can transport them and protect them into the into the garage. And that orange stuff is shielding that yes. basically protects our detector from the LHC beam. So that's why you didn't see the, the shielding had been opened up on the other side, but when we're uh, when they finished moving that other slide slices together, uh, then they will fold that shielding back into place um, and and get ready for for beams to come across the proton. So another fun, interesting thing about if you take a look at this, we what well, this is a big underground cavern, um, and it's essentially a big underground air bubble that we have created, because yes, you know the ground is 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 ground, but you can consider it to be very thick fluid, I guess, and we have special. Uh, geodetic uh, monitoring devices placed all the way around our cavern, all the experimental caverns and the LHC tunnel to monitor the position, the relative positions of these things. And it turns out that these caverns are actually trying to float up to the surface. Uh, they've gone up by a couple of centimeters, I think, since 2006. So if you stick around for a while, you know, eventually you'll see CMS pop out the surface. Okay. So what do we have? What are you next to down there? Yep. So I am at the foot of uh, CMS. So you can see uh, the size, the relative uh, size. It's uh, it's pretty big. And uh, I wanted to show you. So Claire was uh, talking about the magnetic field that can uh, even um, uh, be felt from the uh, service cavern when it's uh, it's on. Um, well, actually, we can also see its effects uh, right here. So I have a bit of a miserable paperclip chain. It's usually much uh, longer to to see uh, the effects. And let's see where it will get. So I can already feel. I feel like a like a source uh, sticker. So that's so cool. So that's residual magnetic field because the magnet is not on right now, but this is just some residual uh, field really, from before. I, so I can feel it, but I don't think that you can see it. So uh, maybe good. you see it. So it should be straight. Let me. Up. Okay, and um, you can see it's slightly moving, yeah, but it's, it's very fine. faint. Yeah. Ah, here you we go. can cheat a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. We can see that. Um, we can see so that. now it's completely stuck. Do you see? Oh, yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've got your uh, cell phone with you as well, you can put one paper clip on and make a like a mm, compass on your phone. Screen. No, I don't have my uh, my phone with me, but you can see it's it's hanging hey, now. That's so, cool. That's cool. So that's residual cool. magnetic field, quite strong. So that's something that happens with electromagnets. Is once you turn them on, then you know the 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 molecules get aligned to create the magnetic field, but when you turn off the uh, electric current, some of that alignment stays uh, in place. So that's how you get stuff like that. It's pretty fun. If you wear, so when, uh, although like Ludovine and then down there, they have to wear safety shoes as well, uh, because part of being in the cavern, uh, you know, just in case our 14,000 pan detector falls over onto your feet. Um, but but if, if she was wearing metal toed safety shoes, you'd also be kind of like, Walking around, but like on the moon. Well, it depends on the shoes. Well, exactly. It's got mine are okay. One. Mine are fine too. <laughs> so I'm fine yeah. too. <laughs> do, do you guys have any question or things that you would like to see underground? Kevin's asking the room. Yeah, Karen, you are muted.
Kevin, you are muted. Mike is talking to you. Oh, yeah. oh, uh, not to us. Okay, yeah. fine. <laughs> Have you discovered any significant new particles? Yes, absolutely. Um, do you mean at all or since 2012? Uh, well, I think in the lifetime of the Large Hadron Collider, oh. you must have done. Yeah, in fact, in fact, um, actually, there's been more than 60 new particles discovered. Um, all of them, except one, are composite particles. So it's like different ways of combining quarks to make types of particles that we call uh, hadrons. And the, mo these have been discovered by one of the experiments called LHCb. Um, but the pride and joy and glory of the LHC and the CMS and ATLAS experiments thus far has been the discovery of what we call the Higgs boson. So yeah. Yeah. you may have heard of the Higgs boson. Uh, the Higgs boson is a fundamental particle. It's, it's not a particle that's made up of other things like, like these other ones. It's, it's a fundamental particle. It is part of the, the very basic set of building blocks that make up the entire universe. And actually, this particle was theorized in the 1960s. And since the 1960s, particle physicists have been looking for it. And the reason why it was theorized is because if we write down the set of equations that describe everything that we know of in the universe, in the 1960s, though that theory explained everything really, really well, except it could not explain why stuff had mass. And yes. we've just had Christmas. I am very much aware of, you know, mass in, you know, daily life <laughs> uh, from all the Christmas pudding I ate. So, um, so mass is very important. And in the 1960s, a bunch of theorists, among them Peter Higgs, uh, François Enclair, and, um, and some others, came up with this concept that the universe lives in a field. And as particles move through the field, the amount that they are dragged on by the field gives them, to us, that looks like a particle has more mass or less mass depending on if they're getting dragged more or less by this field. And of, so we call this the, the BEH mechanism um, in honor of uh, some of the physicists who came up with it first. Now, if, so Peter Higgs was, was, was particularly special because he was the guy who also said, well, if I, if I have an electromagnetic field and I, you know, whack the electromagnetic field, I get a, I get a resonance, which I call an, uh, a photon. And, um, uh, and, and Peter Higgs realized that if you could do this with this BEH field, then you would get a particle associated with the field. And that's why we call the particle the Higgs boson, because it was honor of, of, of Peter Higgs who actually realized that we would get this particle. And that was the thing that we discovered here in 2012 in uh, this experiment yeah. and also the competition experiment across the ring. Yeah. And, and it was awarded with the <laughs> Nobel Prize of Physics the year after, in 2013. Yeah. yeah. So that was a good one. Now, um, what we're doing now is we are study. one of the things we're doing now is studying this, this Higgs boson very, very, very carefully. Um, because, well, the first thing we needed to do was make sure that it was the Higgs boson that was uh, theorized and not some other type of one that, you know, looks a bit like it and acts a bit like it, but it may be different in some ways. So that's something that we're doing. Um, but another thing that we're, we're doing is, remember I told you, like, we could write down this, this set of equations that describes everything that we know of. As it turns out, that everything accounts for a grand total of 5% of the entire universe. In other words, nine, there is 95% of the universe 
that we don't know what it is. And of that 95%, a big chunk of it is, uh, you might have heard people talk about a cosmological constant or an energy that's kind of making the universe expand faster and faster and faster. We leave that to the cosmologists to study. And as particle physicists, we focus on the other uh, chunk of it, about 28% of the universe, which is called, we call dark matter. Um, we call it dark because it does not interact through light or any of our normal forces that we're used to, except for gravity. Um, and it's matter because it, it's, it's, it's got mass, it acts like stuff. So one, one of the things we're doing is we are looking for what this possible dark matter could be. Is it a particle? Is it a, a whole set of particles? If so, can we create it inside the LHC when we smash protons together? Uh, if we can create it, what does that look like? Uh, these are all uh, the type of questions that you know physicists are focusing on right now and will continue to focus on right until the 2040s uh, for, for the lifetime of the LHC. So you're going out now, Lulu. So I'm going out from the lower part of the cavern. So you remember, we enter on the balcony, so about like half uh, the way up to CMS, and then we went all the way down. And now we're exiting. And this uh, this tunnel is a little bit the space that you would have next to the LHC. So you would have like this much of a corridor and then the LHC would be uh, standing uh, standing there on uh, on your side, just to give you an impression of uh, how the tunnel would look like. Of course, this is totally different. It's just a pass through uh, to go to the experimental cavern. So it has nothing to do. And uh, the only thing that is going uh, in this is ventilation, right? So uh, it's not the LHC, <laughs> no beam, all safe. Yeah, and point. then another access door, yeah. Uh, yeah. So those are the blue doors for equipment. So mm. people go through yellow doors and equipment goes through blue doors. Mm. And getting out is usually easier than getting in. No eye scanning for the, for going out. It's important to scan yourself anyway so the system knows that you are out because um, if the system thinks that somebody is still inside, it won't allow people to even put protons into the LHC. Um, so, you know, it's as important to let people know when you're out as it is to restrict people going in. What does the lift say now? How far, how far down are you? Lift uh, very so, cool thing so you can see you can see your depth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so at the at the moment it's coming to us from the from the surface. So you, you can uh, oh no, it's going up. It's going oh. up. It's going up to the surface. So we have to still still wait uh for it. Somebody call it before us. <laughs> so now this person arrived at the surface and now it's going should be going down to us. Yeah. So, um, what else, Kevin? I think there was a. You mentioned that there was a nice question about the quark gluon plasma that somebody had said. Do you want to just uh, remind us what that question was? Kevin, you are muted. I did send. Yes. Okay, I sent an email. This question by email to knowing me. I'm just offering. Uh, what is believed freedom. to be the nature? Sorry. <laughs> what is believed to be the nature and properties of quark gluon plasma (brackets QGP) or quark soup (brackets a state of matter in quantum chromodynamics which exists at exceedingly high temperature, which is thought to have existed in the early universe)? Now, to be honest, I don't understand the question. That's <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I know, I know some of these words. <laughs> So, so that's a really, really great question, um, and particularly like timists as well, because oh, I just want to point out they're going in the lift, and look how far down, look how far underground they are. Ninety-seven. 
97 meters 96. underground. That's the floor. Okay, so while they're in the lift, uh, I can I can try and answer the quark gluon plasma question for you. So, um, so it's it's quite timeless because we just had a, a heavy ion run where we where the LHC instead of protons they were accelerating and colliding lead ions. And the purpose of this is to create this thing called quark gluon plasma. So, what is it? Okay, let's take a little bit of a step back. First, first things first, we have we have four fundamental forces of nature, and in particle physics, we only really care about three of them. So, there's the electromagnetic force, which is light. Then there's the weak nuclear force, which does things like radioactive radioactive decay. And then there is the strong nuclear force. Now, the strong nuclear force is the force that holds quarks together to make up protons. The quarks are, are, there are six different flavors of quark. And if you combine quarks together, you make up things like protons, neutrons, other particles called pions, and that sort of thing. Now, the funny thing, there's, there's a funny twist when it comes to the strong nuclear force, and that is, well, actually, there's two twists. The first twist says that you can only put quarks together in threes or in a quark-anti-quark -quark pair. You can never get one quark on its own. That's the rule. Other interesting thing about the strong nuclear force is that when you put three quarks together, as long as they're close enough together, they actually don't feel the force at all. And they only start feeling the force as they get further and further and further away. So if you think about what you know about gravity and what you know about electric charge, this is like opposite to that, right? Because if you have if you have a, an electric charge here, then the closer you get to it, the stronger it is, and the further away, the weaker it is. But the way that the strong nuclear force works is like you can imagine imagine having a big rubber band, and then you get three people, and and you stand inside this big rubber band. And as long as you're inside this rubber band, you can move around wherever you want. You have no restriction. But if I now decide I want to get rid of out and I try and run out of this rubber band, this rubber band is trying to pull me back and back and back. And the further I go, the stronger I feel this force. So that is how the strong nuclear force acts in today's day and age. Now, way back, right at the beginning of the universe, about 110 billion after the universe was created, the universe was actually so hot that the, the particles did not have this particular restriction, um, this rubber band restriction. And Quarks and gluons, which are the carriers of this force, uh, these quarks and gluons moved freely in the entire universe, not just inside a little rubber band, but through the entire universe, you had quarks and gluons moving freely. And that is what we call the quark gluon plasma. Now, it is special because this is what the universe was like one ten billionth of a second after the universe began, and it remained like that for a few, uh, you know, millionths of a second. And then the force transformed into the way that we see it today. Now, we want to study and understand the way that the universe is Hello. Hello, today, <laughs> and and what the universe, why the universe acts and looks like it does today. And one of the ways that we could do we, we, we do that is by, if we can understand what the universe was like right at the very beginning, then we can run things forward and use that to explain why the universe looks like it is today. 
what the characteristics are of this quark gluon plasma. The word plasma is a bit of a misnomer because um, a plasma is generally uh, accepted to be like a gas, where actually this quark gluon plasma acts more like a superfluid. So like a, 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 a fluid, um, but with this, with like a, you know, suit these, this like no viscous mm -hmm. qualities. And um, you can get some really exciting things happening when you create this. You can get sprays of particles being produced in the center of your detector. And normally because of conservation of momentum, these sprays should balance each other out. Uh, one on either side, but if 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 we create these sprays on the edge of the quark gluon plasma, this one goes straight out into the detector. This one has to fight its way through the quark gluon plasma and actually gets absorbed by the quark gluon plasma. So in your detector, you might only see one big spray of particles coming out. Um, this is something that we call jet quenching. It gets quenched, eaten up by the quark gluon plasma. And by studying this, we can learn a lot more about what the, this quark gluon plasma is, is like. So uh, that's brief history of the universe and, you know, TLDR quark gluon plasma in a nutshell. I don't know if you have anything to add no, to that. No, no. So I, I don't know. At some point, I, I, I didn't have the sound anymore. No, but so basically the properties that we're uh, studying is uh, the, the temperature, okay? Uh, but just maybe before that is just like, presence of this quark gluon plasma because we cannot see it it doesn't really interact directly with the detector so you're only going to see it through um phenomenon like claire was saying like it's uh, it's quenching the jet so one of them gets attenuated then you can check so yeah the, the temperature you can check uh, even uh, i heard the 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 speed of the sound in the in this quark gluon yeah. plasma so you would have a jet, so like uh, one um, uh, quark that hadronize and make this this jet of particles, and it will be like extremely extremely clean around, and so then you could uh, use this somehow to uh, to have the the speed of sound in the in the plasma. So this is uh, these are all the the things that you can uh, that you can do. But basically, yeah, it's a, it's a very hot soup of free quarks and gluons. Yeah, hot, dense soup. Universe is a tasty place, folks. Um, right, so uh, do we have any other questions about anything? You're muted again. Yeah, yeah, I mute you by time to time. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> to the feedback. Could you repeat your question? Yeah. Uh, you, you talk very eloquently then. Do you talk like that at that great speed parties? Just like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, well, it depends who we're at a, at a party with. If it's physicists, we probably tend to speak in more jargon, honestly. <laughs> Um. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Um, you were a bit simple when you were talking. I want to know that I don't agree with you that the mice were killed by the Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a good one. Yeah, if, if you have a look around here, we have lots of boxes. Uh, some of them closed, some of them are opened. There, there are you know potentially a lot of very angry cats around here. Uh, there was a bird too. Um, I was actually on shift, and the the Cern fire department arrived uh, last year, and I think February or something last year, and they said no, there was a bird that got stuck in the cavern. So I was busy watching on actually these monitors behind me and, you know, the, 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 the certain firemen were, were like wandering around everywhere trying to find this bird. Alas, they did not find it. So uh, the safety team here nicknamed the bird neutrino because neutrinos are tiny particles that don't interact. I detected her. Um, well, <laughs> you, you know, neutrino remained elusive until the cavern cleaning when we found the very dry, very dusty, 
carcass mm-hmm. of Neutrino the bird oh. up at the top. Yeah, it's really so, sad. So, uh, rest in peace, Neutrino. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the famous Neutrino decay. That was, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You got a joke. Yeah. Uh, I'll just turn my laptop around so you can just have a view of view of your audience. Oh, oh, okay. Hello, folks. Oh, cool. Hey. Oh, cool. <laughs> awesome. Good to see the back of your head. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I've been looking at. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Um, well, are there any other questions? We are happy to stay here as long as you like. Anybody? No, I've got no no takers for questions. All right. I think we've we've the last question is asking. So uh, if I there's something we, that comes up later, to... you can always write and we will answer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I think that what we really need to do is to say thank you very much indeed. Well, and thank I'd you like our well. audience just to. Uh, thank you all as well. You've been a fantastic audience. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the tour and you got to, you know, see uh, some much, special though. parts of the cavern that, you know, even the people who go to visit the cavern don't always get to see. So thank you, Ludovic, okay, for that amazing thank you. tour. And thanks, everyone. And have a great rest of your day. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.